Welcome to this episode of the Comedy Defect Podcast. Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope you had a good time. You've ate a lot, you drunk a lot, and you saw your family for just the right amount of time. Not too long, not too short. <laughs> and, uh, and if you haven't managed to do any of those things and you just went to work instead, I hope you got paid double. And think of this, at least in the January sales, you'd be able to spend some money or maybe go on a nice holiday during the January miserable period that we're going to experience in a couple of days. Or maybe you did something better for New Year. Look, whatever you did, I hope you had a nice relaxing time. And you've plugged this in, you're listening to it in a nice comfy chair, or you're on your way to work, or maybe you listen to it during work, whatever you want to do. So those of you new to the show, welcome. Those who are old to the show, thanks for coming back, guys. This is episode 93. A very funny comedian. He's Australian. His name is Johnny Katz. He supported Dave Chappelle in America. I think it was in Boston. He's an excellent comedian. And I talked to him for about an hour or so. We talked about the universe. We talked about chaos. Johnny was talking about a different book to me. I was talking about a book called Chaos, but written by James Gleek, an American author. He read a different one, but they're both more or less the same thing. It's just, you know, mind expanding. Very interesting books. So get that book if you want. Johnny's book, he talks about the author in, in this podcast. And the one I read was Chaos by James Gleek. And if you like this podcast, we're on Facebook. We're there. We have a page. You can go to Twitter. You can follow me at Winter Dominus. I'm also on Instagram at Winter Dominus as well. That's Winter, D-O-M-I-N-U-S. Now, if you like this podcast enough and you feel like you want to donate, just go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast. I'll donate as little or as much as you feel this podcast is worth. And if you can't donate, that's okay. Just tell your friends about your favorite episode or go to the podcast app and leave us a nice, honest review because it tells people where we are and what we're up to. Now, if you want to do your diligence and go and swat up on what Johnny does, go to Facebook, type in Johnny Katz, J-O-H-N-N-Y, Katz, K-A-T-S, and his website is linked to his Facebook profile. Go and see his live gigs. He's written a new show called Visceral. We talk about this in the podcast as well. But he's an absolutely brilliant comedian, so go and check him out whenever you see him live. You will not be disappointed. And this is a great episode, number 93, with Johnny Katz. Enjoy. Welcome to the Comedy Defect, man. Thank you for coming on the show. It's seven in the evening there, isn't it? Uh, it is, yeah. It's oh, nailed tropical, it. it's raining, and uh, yeah, it's gorgeous. Oh, mate, well, it's raining here, it's not tropical here, it's just cold and miserable. I had to turn off the fan there. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, it's horrible what's happening to you guys. We're, we're, we've just come out the other end, and we're, we're, we're happy. We're all meeting up for Christmas. Well, oh. New South Wales isn't, but we're, I'm in Victoria, so we're kind of different, but they're all fucked up there. No one is as fucked as you and America. Look, dude, I haven't seen you in about maybe eight, was it eight years, maybe six, uh, six I years? I came back. I came back from the UK in 2017. 2017, so, yeah. right. When did, when did we work together last? Uh, we, did a, we did a Mirth gig up in somewhere, the back of beyond somewhere. It was like a middle of somewhere. We're all playing football with Danny Agisolo outside this gig. And we weren't sure if it was going to go on. There was no internet reception at all or like, you know, phone reception. And we went inside and it was like sort of like a, like a, a school panto stage at the back but it wasn't bad at all it was just you know expected to be awful and it was fine oh good that was <laughs> years ago did it we was... play football out the front uh, yeah <laughs> we did we played football out the front and um yeah, yeah and then I ju- remember yeah i do it was uh like it looked like a community hall yeah that's we, it we arrived really early but it was a lovely gig you're right because mm. sometimes that can be horrific but it worked out well that's it goes sometimes, isn't it? You just prejudge it, and it's, it's uh, you're like, oh no, actually, this is fine. Uh, are you still with your missus? No. Oh. Go for it, man. I mean, I'm a comic. We're open books. I'm one of those comics. I don't hide. You were sort of like you were helping making jewelry and stuff the last time I spoke to you, like you know, um, in between time, yeah. the comedy yeah, and she stuff. Had a, she had a thing going in the UK. She would import shoes from overseas mm. and uh, decorate them and I helped her out with that because I, I, I did a business degree before I got into stand-up so I helped her with the financials mm. and all that yeah long story short I just lost my way man I mm. fell in love with this bird so much that I stopped gigging and just focused on her dreams and her goals and I lost my way and then it mm. just ended badly so I snapped back to stand-up and now I've made them the lesson of like never foregoing my own ambitions and mm. just pursuing stand-up so 
fair play, man. That's it. You gotta you gotta focus on you, isn't it? You can only you can make yourself happy first, isn't it? You can't make someone else happy and you be happy off that. Absolutely. Yeah. You moved back when? Uh, beginning 2017. 2017. January. And uh, like, was it just because this relationship ended or? No, because um, we decided to go back home mm. and she wanted to open up a restaurant. So I fucking went into a restaurant, man. I mm. was running a restaurant in wow. hell. Fuck. <laughs> That's <laughs> like hard work. To, to, to go from four gigs a week, mm. five gigs a week, just as a comic. Mm. to basically running a restaurant, organizing rosters. It oh. was hell, man. Man, that sounds, that sounds grueling, man. Like, like so waiting and, and doing all this on its own is, is hard enough. The long hours. So you have to, like, manage the whole thing. Rosters, yeah. pay people, yeah. make sure all yeah. the old orders are coming in. Oh, my God, that's... that's uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess the comedy seemed easy after that. Admin was like, yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. Wow, it, it was it was tough, man. It was, yeah. it was tough, but it essentially, like you know, I've got, you know, the philosophy I've got is you've got to go through shit to realize that you'll you'll never make the same mistake twice. So yeah. I'll never do that again. I'll never give up stand up for anything now. You know, Fair if someone play. comes into my life, they'll be part of it. And mm. I won't. But you know, I just was fucking just fell in love. I think. Mm. So, that's it. Yeah, what did Richard Price say? You're not you're not a man until a woman breaks your heart. So I had my heart broken and then just mm -hmm. that burst that bubble. So now I'm like, just make yourself happy and mm -hmm. find a partner to hang out with. So Yeah. That's it. Was it um are you still friends? Nah, she she went nuts, man. It it was brutal, dude. Whoa. It was fucking brutal. She we lost the shop mm -hmm. because I wanted out and she wanted out, so I sold it. But before we sold it, she was, she met another guy. And she wanted a baby with him, so she was mm. doing pregnancy tests at the shop. Had the pregnancy test out there on display. Mm. Meanwhile, we had just broken up 14 days ago. Mm. And she's with a new guy <laughs> doing pregnancy tests. And then she fucked off to Fiji with him. And I'm flipping burgers mm. while she's at Fiji accessing our joint account money. <sighs> Oh my god! <laughs> it was it, yeah, man. It was like oh. so many of my friends were like, "Dude, um, you know, are you don't fucking kill her, right?" And mm. I'm like, because mm. they were like fearing this is the premise of cold case files. Uh -huh. Like this is how it starts. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, "Don't worry, man. I'm not gonna kill her." Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just you know what, man. Many become that Scandinavians. The Scandinavians have a proverb, and it says, "Many become brave when they're brought to bay." So I was going through this shit and I just went through it. I found the strength to just sell the shop. And then once I sold it, I fucked off completely from her mm. and just went on a six week comedy tour into Outback Australia to do mine sites that just fucking cleansed me. Mm -hmm. And I was loving gigging again. And yeah, from that, I saved up money and bought an apartment in the city somewhere so now i'm i'm good you know that's great yeah. man that's it you know so you you went through the fire man yeah i fucking did i you have a scandinavian quote like you have any connections to there no nothing, nothing no just like you pulled it just pull this scandinavian this is what you gotta do you have, yeah you have a book of quotes of some kind or or like you're very philosophical or do you, do you like meditate as well well, I, 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 I used to meditate during lockdown because mm. we suffered one of the worst lockdowns mm -hmm. in Australia. So uh, lockdown, uh, me meditation helped me during lockdown. Mm -hmm. But the Scandinavian Proverbs, I, I worked in a shitty office job when I was like 18, 19, and the daily calendar had a proverb. So I would read it <laughs> and I'd rip out and keep the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> they, they stuck though. That's good, man. They, I, I just read them and go, oh, that's great. And they just go. That's what it is. Uh, a nice you pull. haven't held on to any like nothing. You haven't held on to any like some of them are so good. I love them. Um, like, like a good joke, you know. Mm, yeah, I mean that, that that's uh, but like when they're every day, you're like, oh, that's a nice one, and they just I just I just get pushed out by something else. Those mining tours are uh, very they're earthy gigs, aren't they? You can just anything goes, right? They're they're tough mm. because they're uh, essentially the alpha male type of guys. You know, these are mm. guys that are in under the earth for like twelve hours a day hauling rocks up so they're, they're tough gigs they're outdoor gigs so there's a there's a gap in the world of stand-up comedy you want to minimize the gap between you and the audience so 
these are big gaps where you're shouting your jokes across a, a garden into the beer hall. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's challenging, and the material is uh, less whimsy, set up and punch, more direct assault sort of comedy, nothing too fancy. So they're tough gigs, but they're worth doing. I absolutely enjoy them because it's tough. It, Murph Control made me a much better comic mm-hmm. because, you know, the gigs we go to in Murph Control, it's similar. You don't know what you're going to get. The environment is completely different each gig that you do for Murph Control uh, as opposed to just cutting your teeth at a handful of London comedy clubs. Mm. You'd be way more versatile if you just did that. So that helped me become more versatile. They're tough. But also the guy who takes you out there, Chris, he understands the country and so he's got a good grasp of the uh, Aboriginal Australian history. So as you drive through regions of Western Australia, which is as big, it's, it's a huge, it's like France, Spain, Germany, all rolled into one. Yeah. That, that's how big it is. So mm. you, you're covering some extreme distances and the land is, what you see originally mm. is uh, you think you're on Mars, red, earth horizon. Then you see ant hills. then you see certain rocks, then you see gorges pull over and like gorges that have been there for millions of years and yeah. you cli- climb down this crevice and then you're just jumping in a natural spring been there for thousands of years that's amazing and there's there's history on there he shows you some cave paintings it's Mm. fucking unreal that's like as you say cleansing man you're you're putting some distance between you and your life that just happened and you're like oh man this is that's amazing that's like it just you're it's like when you take a holiday from yourself yeah that's exactly what it was unplugged yeah and you're also doing stuff for radio now yeah years ago i had my own show oh right yeah, years ago, but now it's essentially uh, just writing and performing. When did you start, Johnny? I started in Melbourne, two thousand and two. Whereabouts did you? Uh, where was your first gig? It was at the Corner Hotel in Richmond, which is an inner city suburb of Melbourne, and it was uh, there was a band playing in the next room. <laughs> right. And it was open mic <laughs> and. Yeah, anyone, everyone understands what that means. It was just horrific for everyone involved. Yeah. How about you? Uh, mine was, I think it was July 23rd, 2003. Um, right, mine's July 18. Ah, nice. Cancer. <laughs> it is a cancer. Uh, was it like, so you're um, like an... It's interesting you know your first gig date. Like, you know, it's, it's more, it's special like your birthday, isn't it? For sure, like, I mean, I didn't gig consistently from then, but, like, I just, you know, that's definitely the time when, oh, God, I love this. This is brilliant. And then that the second gig was, uh, I mean, worse than the first. But, like, you know, because you think, oh, no, this is oh, this is just pure me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm smashing this. I'm like, no, it's just a very supportive crowd. Why did you get up and do it? I've had this question a lot of times mm. with friends, family, other podcasters. I'm just not sure. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a mixture of things. I was, I had an older brother and my older brother would let me hang out with his friends but yeah. i wasn't allowed to talk because i was i was seven or eight years younger so yeah. I, when i did talk i needed to keep it quick so i generally wanted to just move them somehow by mm-hmm. making them laugh and so i started wanting to inject comments to make them laugh quick ones and i remember they all gathered around to watch Eddie Murphy Delirious and it just confused me how someone on the TV could have so much dominance over the whole living room and make everyone in the room laugh and completely focused on what he was saying. So that embedded, that was instilled in me at a young age. And Mm. then one of my next memories was whenever neighbors would leave after having a coffee with my parents, I would impersonate the neighbors. (laughs) <laughs> my parents so then there was that and I noticed each reaction generated a laugh and then I had a few relationships and I think each relationship each girl would say like your saving grace was your sense of humor um, so then I was like well that's another thing and then I saw that stand-up comedy was actually a thing and they did it in Melbourne and that just completely freaked me the fuck out so I went down and I just was compelled to try and jump up and do a spot. So that's 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 what drew me to it. All yeah. those factors just came in and collided with each other. And then, boom, I had to do it. 
uh, like I knew I wanted to do some sort of performance. I didn't know what it was as well. And I, I tell you, the first thing that happened to me was when I was in. It was more. I was a very quiet and shy kid, similar to yourself actually. I just would sit in the background, and there was a guy that I'd watch, and I'm like, oh man, he look what well, he's holding the room. He's just like telling stories about like how hammered they got the other night, and everyone's laughing and having fun. And I was like, I want to be like that. I want to be that guy that has the stories or the, you know, the, the keeps everyone's attention, has fun with like the, the um, is it a good laugh to be around, you know? So I, I watched this guy for, it was about a couple of, maybe a couple of years. And eventually I started to come out of my shell and, and I was in a, in a pub one night in, um, in a place called Skull and we were all like, we're all getting hammered and uh, we had this really small pub called Hackett's and we're all sitting in this tiny, tiny pub and there was like a table of eight people and I had all these stories like nailed down in my head. I knew, kind of knew where the laughs were, but I didn't know. I just I knew there were fun points. I didn't know there were kind of laughs. I just was, give it energy there, you know. And so I, I told all these stories that I've been banking back to back with energy and just was like, you know, and they all gave me a round of applause when I'd finished. And I was right. like, so I said to him, I said to my mate, I said, did you see that? I said, what was that? What just happened there? <laughs> You know, I was like, because I didn't, I, I didn't know stand up at all. And I was like, what, 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 what how do I do, how do I do that? <laughs> you know, and no one had a clue to tell me which way to go and, you know, to get onto it. And I was like, well, maybe I could be a presenter. I don't know. Well, what can I do? And, and so I was for years trying to find the, the thread of like, you know, what I was and what I wanted to do. Like that was the quickening, like, you know, for the whole thing. I was like, oh man, that, I was just like, walk away, go, oh my God, this is, this. I, what is it? You know, there was no, there was no thing root where I was. For Eddie Murphy, was he your, the first stand-up you ever saw on TV or? There was the first exposure to someone mm. ripping the roof off. Yeah. Of a room. Yeah, that was the first person. Yeah. Is he one you most admire as a comic or like as you're growing up? Or? As you grow, you evolve. Like mm. I've, I watched delirious re recently and it doesn't you know there's parts of it that are just you know, it doesn't really stack up but yeah i mean at the moment i like you know dave Chappelle, like bill burr and all those guys and certainly back in the day when i was growing up yeah eddie murphy was definitely up there you i mean so you're you're a support act for dave Chappelle in 2004 right yeah that's right that's it on the boston yeah. comedy club in new york city nice yeah that's great yeah it was surreal I was on the bill, he arrived, and they were going to pull the show, but he said, no, nah, put the kid on, come all the way from Australia, and, and put him on, and then I'll go on after him. So I went backstage, I met him, very down-to-earth guy, very humble. Yeah, just, but stand-ups mostly are, I think, because mm. we fucking die so often, it yeah. brings us back down-to-earth. Whereas an actor, a Hollywood actor, has everyone just blowing smoke up their ass, tell them they're amazing. But we have mo moments of sheer gravity drops where mm. our shit doesn't fly and we're like, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm so mortal right now. Totally. It is, man. I've seen, I've seen stars eat. Like, I've seen Eddie Izzard struggle. I've seen Michael McIntyre struggle in London. I've seen... Dave Chappelle, I saw him struggle in parts when I watched him do, admittedly, three hours at the Boston Comedy Club. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you just see how they're trying to find something, and that's when I realized, oh fuck, they're not, they're not gods. That you can get there. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna take years of uh, complete honesty and solid work. Did you manage to build in any of the of the pain? To like you got from your last relationship of running a restaurant and stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I did. I've, I've let it. I've written it all down, mm. and I'm slowly like chucking it in chunks. Um, but we, oh, there was a comedy festival that was going to happen this year, but it never eventuated. Uh, where I wanted to workshop an hour of it, I'll just have to wait now. But having said that, how bad are you guys? Are you, I don't think you guys aren't performing at all now. Or what's the, the it's all completely cancelled, man. Like I've had four gigs like this year, just gone, and just it's been, God, it's just been painful. Like it just, oh, I miss it so much. Like it's just, you know, there's there's no festivals. There's like online stuff, but it's just not the same. It's, no, no. it's there's no connection, you know. It's just um. And people, as I say before, that people have been more concentrating on the comments in the in the comment bar than your actual set. You know, they're like, oh, they're just riffing with each other. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just it's it's pretty dire, man. There are people getting booked for online gigs, but 
even they're few and far between as well, you know? And yeah. they've got like the pick of the bunch now because everyone is so desperate for work. Where are you? Are you in London? I'm in, uh, I'm just outside, maybe like Hemel Hempstead is where I am. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, like 40 minutes from. But um, yeah, it's all right. I mean, here it was in tier three and then they just put everyone in tier four apart from the north because they didn't want to piss them off. <laughs> 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 Which is weird. Like the Northmen, let's not annoy them. Oh no, they come down here. But it was just like, oh God, it's just, um, yeah, it's uber depressing at the moment. Like the second day of tier four. So um, so what does that mean? Uh, like we had, a, we had four reasons. Our most strictest lockdown was uh, four reasons to leave the house like one hour exercise yeah shops medical or compassionate ground yeah so that's, that's it i think that's exactly the same really you're not allowed to go anywhere apart from go to work um or yeah just got to go you know, just essential um travel really like go to the shops you, like basically the food shop is the only thing that's really open so anyway, you did meditation to try and get out of out of <laughs> travel somewhere i guess did you do meditation before the lockdown no and how did you f find it helped you i was able to uh, extract myself from the anxiety of being trapped inside an mm. apartment i was able to almost the way i describe it to people is it just i was able to float to the bottom of the pool and just look up and just relax that yeah i was in a shit situation but i could remove myself from any anxiety and it wasn't anything like spiritual or it was just an app on a phone mm. where it's no nonsense how to without the candles and the scented stuff just how to meditate and what to do so i did it i started at five minutes and then i worked my way up to 30 sometimes 40 minutes and it felt like 10 minutes when i came out of it and then i started reading books on people that were like lost at sea shipwrecked mm. people that were traversing across the arctic pole and suffered injury or someone who was climbing everest and fucked up and almost died because then putting just hearing store reading stories about people who were trapped and how mm. to survive just strengthened my resolve so i just sort of tried to adapt to my environment i started workshop writing with other stand-ups instead of doing nice. zoom gigs i started just writing and then once a week i would just throw material back and forth with friends it's a good idea i managed to get yeah i managed to get some stuff out of it so when clubs opened up i hit the ground running mm. i had like seven minutes of pretty good stuff that's made it into my main set and i'm happy about that um, that's good man you're like you're, you're modeling you're modeling uh people in the same situation as you and like you're that, I'm, I'm sure you got some decent uh, material out of actually uh plumbing the depths of isolation you know i mean i'm not going to go into all no. my material because it sounds tacky but yeah sure. i was i went picking mushrooms and got arrested right and, um, i have to front court so i've got to talk to the judge about all of that yeah. and i've written a speech for the judge <laughs> that I'm going to read out and it's something along the lines of why am I here today in court? Uh, I was picking mushrooms. There are people in this courtroom. Uh, we, they had extremely high rates of domestic abuse against women mm -hmm. during lockdown in Melbourne. And I'm sure I'm going to be in this courtroom with some of those animals and I shouldn't be. The worst thing I did on mushrooms was piss my plants in my living room. Mm -hmm. uh, that's as crazy as I got. Yeah. And now I'm in this court facing charges. So, you know, things like that. And then I wrote some other stuff about being in lockdown, how nervous it made me and tense. I started buying caged eggs because I was like, ah, oh, fuck them, we're in this together. And just other bits and pieces I would scribble down. So it helped, you know, constantly trying to write. But it was very, very hard because you sort of lost your way, your compass, mm -hmm. you were on stage getting your bearings whether this is funny or not so yeah talking to a friend would help or another comic about bouncing ideas is that what you're doing at the moment that's the a problem? really good do you know at the moment I'm, i've just put together um like just to I've put it all in some semblance of a document just the next show that i want to do because i did a clean show last year uh, i did a clean 45 and it was called squeaky and i was like okay let's uh let's see if i can like hammer something without any rude stuff and it was it was a challenge 
uh, but my brain started shifting more towards much darker material. And so I was like, okay, I've done, I've done, but I stayed on clean, but I was like, okay, right. So the next year, which is, was this year, I was going to do um, a much darker show and it's like a bit more, it just feels a bit more me, but I just wanted to see if I could, I could do it, you know, without, without kind of turning to uh, any crude or edgy stuff, you know? So I was like, yeah, I did it and um, I performed it in uh, the Museum of Comedy. Yeah, that was just before the lockdown. So it was like, it's in Feb- end of February, uh, just before March. And I was like, oh, this is, this is not a good time. I've written the show. That most of the jokes are there, but I'm just trying to weave them together at the moment. But it, as you say, it's like motivation. I think I might start up a workshop group like you're doing there. And again, before the lockdown, I had a little, small little workshop group that I kind of would meet every Monday or Wednesday. And we kind of bounce ideas off each other and some really new people were there and I was like, oh, this is great. Some of the stuff was great, you know, just some, come on, that's brilliant, you know, just keep going. And it's just really nice to have that sort of connection with other people who are trying to do the same thing as you, you know, it's difficult. That fell away and then I started, because I had a gig in um, Fisheries Wharf Cafe, which is down the road from me, like five minutes away. And that was going great. We moved from a 60-seater to like an 80-seater. Then I started up another place, which is like, again, 10 minutes away from me. It was a theatre room and then lockdown happened, man, and it just was like, oh no, this is just going great guns. And then I was like, then the lock- first lockdown happened, and then it eased, and then I booked more acts for the next few months, and then it happened again. I was like, oh, god damn it, man. But you know, that's how it goes, you know. But like the, uh, yeah, so I'm trying to, so I'm trying to put this one together. I'm trying to figure out, you know, you're just like trying to get a name, you know, a name for your show. You're like, no, that name doesn't fit. I can't hang everything on that name. Um, so for, for question for you then, Johnny, how many shows have you done? Show, yeah, or just right, full shows like have you written? Uh, about seven, yeah, about seven. How, uh, what was the name of them? I can't remember all of them, right. but um, one of my the latest one I was going to do, which during the lockdown was called Visceral, just re- that ranting style, just raw. And then I did another one on radio called Uncut. Because mm. everything that ever was taken off air from radio, I put into a bin and I stored it and I used it on stage. Because I don't know if you've ever done radio, but it's extremely uh, limiting. Mm. They have parameters on you, what mm. you can and can't say. And especially now in this politically correct environment, it would be so such a difficult place to traverse. Ugh, I'm sure like a lot of comics are freaking out. Uh, what other shows that I do? Uh, one on the universe I did, mm. which was pretty. I really enjoyed that. It wasn't laughs per minute, but I still enjoyed it. And yeah. It was based on like quantum mechanics and whoa, and black black holes and all that. Yeah, yeah. Did you read that book, Chaos? Michael Chown. It's, it's got a black cover um, with like I think it's um it's like electrons and stuff all over the thing. It might be Michael Chown. What's Chow. that called? Uh, it's just called Chaos. I think it's. Uh, Marcus Chown, oh, sorry, maybe, mm. but no, I, I don't. I think I have, but years ago, this was like seven years ago. Yeah, it's like it, I think it starts off with like a really simple analogy of how one thing, little thing, can ch- change the weather. You know, he was a, a meteorologist for a while and then measured the weather repeatedly. He said the weather should trying to you know trying to predict predict the weather they were trying to do, and it would be the same uh, air pressure, temperature, and it should be exactly the same weather every time, but it isn't. You know, it just keeps, one little thing keeps changing the outcome, even though it should be more or less the same weather every day. It was it was really interesting that, you know, the, the universe just loves chaos. It kind of really thirsts for chaos rather than... Uh, on, a, on a fundamental level, it's chaotic and hmm. uh, unpredictable hmm. overall. But that's how, it's, it's amazing. But then when you look at it on a macro perspective, like uh, Isaac Newton, it was like clockwork, the, the planets around the solar system and calculus and how you can predict everything. They thought the universe was very, you know, like a clock, how the planets mm. rotated around the sun. But then on closer inspection, it's actually chaos that rules. I mean, I did meditation last year. I was the start of this year, actually, started this year. I was like, right, I'm going to meditate for every day. I did for like two months, meditate every day. And there was a moment when I was doing it, when I just kind of like hit that kind of like the bliss moment. Do you know when it's like you, it's like you're like taking drugs and you're like just on, on that high and that sort of like on that, that peak of, of, of like, you know, your, of your, of your high. And I was just like, whoa, this is, this is mad. Did you reach, attain that sort of, that moment? 
yeah, did you, yeah, I felt my body was completely and utterly numb mm. and relaxed. And I felt like I was floating. Yeah. And I felt this perfect uh, acceptance and appreciation of tick and cock. And just, that's it. It was beautiful. And they're the moments where I thought I was down for only five, ten minutes, but I looked at my watch and I was gone for 40. And like, Pretty cool. Do you do you do it once a week to top up, or do you like just you you done now? You've you finished. I'm kind of done now. Yeah. Because I, it's interesting. I don't I don't want to get too zen. I like <laughs> to have a bit of um, madness about me. I don't want to forgive certain people. I like to keep them locked up in my mind in a certain <laughs> room and hell of use with them every so often. And I'm scared that meditation will unlock that door and let them all out, and mm. they'll, be, they'll be forgiven. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Because I just I don't know. I'm just fearful no i do know i'm fearful i'm gonna lose that rage on stage which i adore because i don't have it during the day I, i'm a very peaceful shy quiet reserved person but when i get up on stage i have moments of anger and rage and mm. it's so bizarre that uh, if i'm dating a girl I, i'm be very skeptical about bringing her to a gig straight away because she'll see something different yeah. and she might get spooked. But it's funny, I was talking with a comedian the other day about what it's like when you're on stage versus off stage. Mm. And apart from the obvious, like it's a drug to be on stage, it's like you're this other person, maybe an alter ego or a different version of you, and it's completely enjoyable and fulfilling so that when you're off stage, you're just calm. You can go home and read a book and have a cup of tea and not go out relax oh absolutely i i feel that too in the meditation thing i know you're saying that like you're letting go of stuff and and losing that that rage like th this year for me the, that like you know when you like reach a stage in your life and you're like god I'm, I'm quite i'm quite content now i'm quite content you're like hang on where was the, all the energy that i had <laughs> that got me through everything else <laughs> that anger is fuel is like you know for years has been fuel for me to get loads of stuff done and when the anger kind of subsides it's like, oh well, what have I got to run on now? What what is the what what, what you know what kind of flux capacitor do I uh, recalibrate to keep this motor going? Yeah. But there's always a new thing to be angry about. There's always something. <laughs> yeah, in our line of work, definitely. Mm. So your favorite show was what then of all the the seven you you've done? Probably the uh, physics one because it was just so different. Yeah. And I enjoyed. I enjoyed the facts so much. And I enjoyed the dichotomy of the universe of the small juxtaposed against the universe of the large, how conflicting they are and what it all means, if it means anything, and how the universe may in fact seems intelligently designed. Like mm -hmm. when you look inside an atom, there are certain rules that an atom holds steadfast to. Like two electrons will only occupy the first orbit around a proton, mm -hmm. never three because there's an imbalance in the construction of the atom. So who laid down those laws and what did and whether it was a, a multiverse and all the possibilities eventuated or whether it was yeah. uh, just this universe and someone intelligently designed it and then fucked off. Who knows? But that sort of stuff kicked me up a gear. And how things like nothing is actually touching. Like when you touch a table, you're not touching it. When you're sitting in a chair, you're not really sitting on mm. it. It's just magnetic forces. The atoms are never touching, so nothing touches. So then I went on to do jokes about, well, I shouldn't be charged with sexual harassment then because I never really touched her and all that sort of shit. And, yeah. you know, so it's just, yeah. you, you're saying something funny and then you're, you're that crass comic. Mm. You're like, so you're blending sexual harassment with wonderful facts about yeah. the universe. Yeah. It's just, that was a lot of fun for me. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. What time did you have that show on at? Because that, like, you know, it sounds like, um, you know, that's what is the one with Stephen Hawkins' um, audio book? Oh, brief History in Time, is it? Yeah, it's a Brief History in Time or The Universe in a Nutshell. Mm. One of those ones. Yeah. The audio book, yeah. That's it. What, what time did you have your show? Uh, this What was it called again, sorry? Uh, it, was, it was 7 p.m. 7 p.m. That's not bad. 7 yeah, 7 p.m. I figured it'd get in early because, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to work after 11. No. <laughs> it's going to be a tough one, is it? It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll end up resorting to dick jokes. Yeah. 11 p.m., everyone's drunk. Oh, fuck. Okay. 
finding it. We're finding it tough here and now out of lockdown. We're doing a lot of backyard comedy gigs because it's summer here and clubs got hit bad. So some of them just couldn't open again. So yeah. Yeah, it's a bit shit. So we, there's a lot of backyard comedy going on. So we're performing in outdoor venues and the, uh, we've got the elements kicking in, rain, wind. It's just so bizarre. Yeah. So everyone's material is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah. It's interesting. It's mm. like evolution. We're yeah. evolving this style of comedy, which is just quick setup, quick punch. You can't tell stories, man, when you're in backyard comedy because... People are walking past you. I was on stage. Well, I wasn't on stage. I was in someone's backyard doing a gig yeah. and a dog's just sniffing my crotch. You know, <laughs> kids are playing in the pool to the left and the parents are like drinking wine going, no, no, don't worry about the dog. Just go on, do your punchlines. Do yeah. your thing. You know, you drop a punchline and then the crowd turn around and go, oh, that happened to Sally, didn't it? Remember that happened to Sally? Oh, yeah. And they forget this isn't... Because they, they're in their own fucking backyard. They yeah. think this is a social occasion so the yeah. whole chemistry and makeup of stand-up comedy has gone out the window and when you do clubs they're all socially distanced so you don't get that big hit of laughs so they're all spread out mm -hmm. you know we're gigging again so we're happy that's it my brother lives in uh, adelaide and um he said he's like he has to go to the border make sure people don't come in and stuff and then when oh, it, what does the, he do? he's a policeman Wow, there you go, yeah. That's it, so it's crazy. But, um, yeah, so you're completely free now, so you can do, is that the whole, just your area or the whole of Australia? Just Vic Victoria. Uh, the only problem problematic state now is New South Wales. Right. New South Wales had an outbreak. Someone breached hotel quarantine on December 1st, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I genuinely believe that it's real. So right. someone got out. The story is someone got out of hotel quarantine. They caught them, but it was too late. They visited the northern beaches to a cafe and then mm. sure enough left the trail of destruction. So that mm. caused a cluster outbreak. So now they've locked down New South Wales and all the rest of the country has shut their borders to New mm. South Wales. So they're going to have a shit Christmas, but Victoria is okay. We went through the worst uh, from about July till just last month, right. but nothing like you. No, this is getting silly now. It's getting ridiculous. Like, Yeah, apparently you've got a strain of like coronavirus, which is like next e next level. It's like easily <laughs> catchable. It's in Kent. Right? It's in. It started in Kent, apparently. I'm like, come on. You know, oh, this guy, it's like crazy. I mean, the, the, the place that's got the biggest backlog of traffic when you're trying to get there for a gig now is, is Kent. It's like, I mean, coming out, apparently, the virus travels really well out of it. I don't know how. Um, but, you know, it's just, oh, I know, it's frustrating. Do you, Johnny, do you remember your first joke you ever wrote? Yeah, I do. It was shit. Um, do, do, I, do I have to say it? If you don't want to, like, but you, you can say what it was about. What was it about? Okay, I'll say at the forefront that it was a really shit joke and it had to do, the premise was something like McDonald's applied for, uh, for a license to emblaze across the moon with lasers, uh, the golden arches on a full moon. And I thought that would be really pleasing to everyone in Africa. Um, so yeah, that was the premise, starving kids, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was, you know, yeah. I don't do that, and I stopped doing it very quickly. <laughs> um, uh, but what about you? What was my first, first joke. joke? Oh man, um, I think it was probably a story. To be honest, I think it was just stories about getting absolutely hammered and um, yeah. just not just kind of getting a little bit strange in places like because um, I, I started had a misspent youth of just going out when I was about from the age of thirteen to well, in my maybe mid to be fair mid too too old mid twenties picking up stories and of weird stuff someone finds a bag of powder on the table and uh and then they you go oh yeah what's this and they say well it doesn't matter let's try it <laughs> you know it turns out it's a bag yeah. of washing powder do you know what i mean yeah, so they're the people that are going to say no to the vaccine by the way <laughs> yeah they, we, they, this is it like but yeah i think it was more story based my stuff high energy storytelling at the time yeah lots of energy just didn't know which way it was going you're writing you're a show for this year or uh, this year I wrote a show called Visceral more of a rage uh, ragey sort of angry sort of uh, style because when I saw you it was very sort of like it was kind of ca much calmer and thoughtful I guess is because like this country I guess is more 
uh, they want a bit more kind of cerebral stuff. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just felt like I've got this uh, idea in my head that I need to just go deeper into what I actually believe about things and then just spit them out. And that's yeah. why Visceral was going to be an opportunity to say what I think that um, certain topics I was going to just fluff around with on stage. Mm. You know, I think they're chasing perfection and it's fucking us up and around my neighborhood all these clinics are popping up where they can inject something into your lips yeah. and they put you on micro dose of steroids and everyone's seeking perfection and running off and taking photos of themselves and taking it putting it through filters and all yeah. that and then you know studying physics for the show that i did i realized that you can't have perfection the universe relies on imperfection because matter distributed across the universe of the big bang is perfectly that allowed gravity to coalesce that matter to form planets and stars so uh, and then i say if you take mushrooms you'll work that out for yourself and, uh, but i'm not saying take mushrooms when you're on the train with your friend heading to the football you get a different sort of thing yeah so these are all topics that yeah. I was that's great like with. I, I really like yeah. it i like that so, but like you said microdosing steroids is that like for like actually for building muscle Yes, so there's this huge push. There's a lot of men who are 45 plus that are microdosing steroids at a clinic uh, on the high street. One of them's called A Plus, which is near my house. And as opposed to bodybuilders mm. that would do a whole shitload, mm. um, microdosing, a doc, there's a doctor there and he gives you a certain amount of steroids when you're 45 plus once a month i think it's like a thousand and a half dollars per month for membership so it's it's out of my league but yeah it, it just stimulates testosterone production because as you go over 45 yeah. your, your testosterone lowers so it boosts your testosterone and increases muscle mass and gets you that youthful uh, gusto back right so to speak yeah uh, so heaps of people are on it. It's very popular here in Melbourne. That's um, that's kind of terrifying, isn't it? You're like yeah, it is. jacking all these people, old people up who have got all these potentially outdated thought processes, and like you're like, no, no, you should be on the downslope now. Just relax. <laughs> you know, we yeah. figured out some more stuff. Okay, just calm down. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're dead right. But I, I don't know, maybe you need to find something else to be angry about. I, I like that show, Visceral, though, from what you explained to me there. It sounds like uh, you're really plumbing the depths of what you really, you know, what really kind of grinds you, your gears and certain things. But that's where I want to go, mm. yeah. Because I figure, you know, you can just do festivals and get your own sort of... I've noticed when I do shows, certain people come up to me like, oh, can I follow you? And what's your tag and all that? Mm. What's your, so what are your socials? And it's interesting that it's all about when I go deep about certain points of view, you know, it's, I, I understand completely what my role is. It's to make people laugh. But I think what happens is as you get older, you realize that if you sort of reassess the situation and maybe not necessarily, yes, you have to go for the punchline. That's paramount. But, the journey towards the punchline should be something that's really about you yeah, or what you're about. And, you know, who knows? I mean, you could be a Jimmy Carr and it's all about the punchline and all about shocking and yeah. all about making people go, holy fuck, what the fuck? Or it could be like a Bill Hicks or like a whatever, um, you know, um, Joe Brand or whatever style you have, but I think just authentic something from you rather than panel beat and mesh together punchlines that oh this will work because it's like a it's a similar premise to like you know uh, something mm. that I saw once on a Netflix special and mm. I know this will work and then I know this will work. It's like Frankenstein. You're building a routine that's yeah. inorganic, so you just have to like go backwards and go well. Who are you? What do you like? And then from that, write down all your, your opinions on everything and then just go on stage and talk about them. So that's what I was going to do with Visceral because mm. I remember reading a biography on Richard Pryor and he, I think he did a gig once. 
he he saw where the money was so he tried to do bill cosby's style of comedy mm. in the 50s and it was working he would mm. do completely he wouldn't rip off bill cosby but it was that style he knew what they wanted so he gave them that mm. and he did a gig and uh he got a thunderous round of applause and then he left the stage and he thought, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So he left, he abandoned, his, he threw his wallet out, he threw his license, his credit cards, his mm. money, and he disappeared uh, into another state and rented a room with just a mattress and a TV. And he started entertaining every thought that popped into his head and doing open mic with every thought that popped into his head just mm. so he could work out what he's about. Yeah. And that's what Visceral is in a nutshell. It's an homage to that style um, to try and get some sort of uniqueness, not for any purposes of achieving fame or success, but for my own self to have a body of work of this is why I think taking mushrooms is okay once a year. This is why I think we should have one charger that runs, that charges everything on this fucking planet. And just certain points and then debate them on stage and take a point of view. But that's the thing, isn't it? Every show you do is sort of, cry, it, you kind of go, okay, though, that, like, for example, myself, I did a clean show. I was like, mm, I, I don't really think that I'm a clean comic. It definitely just wanted to see if I could do it. Okay, I've done that. You yeah. worked through that that kind of issue you had with yourself. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then you go, it's right, okay. Well, did that. It's great that you did that. I, I just felt. a challenge to set yourself. Yeah, like I thought, like, you know, I mean, I thought, well, everyone's like kind of booking less, oh, I feel like risque, it's risque, <laughs> do people use the word risque anymore? <laughs> well, yes, yeah, certainly, certainly here in, Mel- in Melbourne, they have, uh, yeah, well, there's there's politically correct police Yeah, that will ju- jump on you, you know, and not l- listen to what you're actually trying to say. Like, well, a lot of the gigs that now, there's, you go to them for or maybe potentially mirth or um, gigs that are set up in like the outer back of beyonds of, of the UK and they're an older crowd. And if you go too hard uh, at them, they kind of recoil and just go, oh no, we can't listen to this. This is, you know, my wife is here and potentially my child, <laughs> you know, I can't listen to that thing you know they're not as earthy unless you go further further north but it's like so i was like right okay i need to write something for the the sort of middle-aged uh you know the kind of kind of like hunger for direction you know basically sort of um and so i was like well, try it and so that thought the clean stuff and it, and it does work it really does work but for me personally to you know as yourself you got to feed your own demon inside that as we let out we get onto the stage so you're trying to find what that demon eats you know what do you what do i feed that to make it to make that better because i know that that is where the the momentum and the energy lives you know and what is that for you is what is it storytelling a dark story no it, it's not i don't think i think it's just like um it, it's a sort of like more of a, a a lateral thought and and kind of going towards the like just looking at taking it taking a subject apart and just and, and pulling it to pieces and going okay well look at this this, this is ridiculous is it like you're uh, uh, i'm just trying to work it out are you uh, justifying using logic from an absurd premise yeah it funny is that that's okay, right yeah that that's a good buzz that's it that's it exactly it's like you know look, look, so i think we should do this you know look just hear me out that kind of thing you know i think this yeah. would be the best thing yeah it's just it's so fun and i've had such a great re- and it's and it's just like a it's now it's a whole like seven minute bit it's great, oh, that's great. um so like and that i was like that is it that's the thing i want to do more of that kind of <laughs> this is the logic we should be sticking to i mean your brightness visceral is it nearly there i think so yeah i just have to i've got well i think the, the festival that I was going to do may be coming back in two months' time. So mm. I should have a crack at February where I can Great. cut it out. But I believe it's mostly mostly there. The, the concepts that I want to go through are there. I tend to have an idea of where the joke is, but I also discover that on stage, if I'm relaxed, I branch out into these areas and I find a punchline. Do you find that? Oh yeah, of course. Like you know, you just yeah, just keep uh, mining the stuff and keep keep going over it. You kind of go stir crazy after a bit, don't you? Yeah. And you like just go your brain like when you rehear- you know go through rehearsing something, go oh god that goes oh yeah, and then your brain just goes well we I've, we've done this take away a hundred times and it just makes the leap. Do you like go to uh, the New Zealand festivals as well, or do you stick in Australia? I stick to Australia. I haven't been to New Zealand. Uh, 
I, yeah, I haven't been. I've been sticking just to uh, Australia, unfortunately. I think financially it's very difficult to get to New Zealand mm. and uh, make money out of a circuit there and come back. Whereas something like, uh, well, London was amazing. It was busy almost every night. You probably know how good it is, the circuit in London. Mm. It sounds easier to travel to New York than it is to New Zealand, is it? It's easy to go to New York if you do a festival. If you can get into a right festival, you'd, mm. make, you'd make your money back just from the sheer volume. But New Zealand would be harder you know, unless you've got a sort of celebrity status. Right, you know, right. With guaranteed sales. Charmin Hughes. Yes. You know, I was talking to her and I said, I've, I've, you know, you've got an observation rolling around your head for a while. You're like, oh, this is, this is, I think stand-up comedy is the only profession where the c- countries import other idiots because they don't like the idiots they've already got. Yes. Isn't it, God? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, I was, oh my God, this is, this, you know, like, oh, no, no, that's the same old idiot we've seen before. What is he, different idiot? Okay, great, thanks, sorry. We'll give you money for that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, go to to New Zealand and gig, and they're like, "Oh, it's great, it's great." I can make they love you down there. I was like, "Okay," and then I was asked you because I know you're Australian, so I was like, "You know, you're kind of going, uh, well, actually, well, you know, we're it's not that far. It's like the neighbors, and like we, we don't we know you guys. <laughs> you're from Australia. We don't give a yeah. shit about your idiocy." Well, that's it. That's a, that's exactly right. That's what I told comics that uh, in London, and they're going to do Perth, and mm. they're going to do Adelaide. I said, just put. A fucking UK, just put the Union Jack on your poster and say mm. from the UK because the, the crowd just think if you've sat on a plane for 20 hours, yeah. uh, you must be a pro. You know, you've come all this way to do comedy. So they would rather, if they've got $10 in their hand, they would rather go to an international act as opposed to a local act because they think they're getting something exotic, something yeah, that's being imported. That's it. Imported is finer, except yeah. if you're an Aussie going to New Zealand. Yeah, you're, then you're just a fucking Aussie. You're like a you're like a juicy mango from Pakistan. Yeah, you know, you're like oh look at that mango. Oh yeah, this is it. Just that's it, man. Yeah, great. Something yeah. different and juicy. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> what festival are you going to take that show to, Visceral? Here in Melbourne, Melbourne Festival. And yeah, Melbourne Festival is coming up. There's a small one coming up, which is like a underground one in February that runs along, uh, not the Melbourne International one. So I'll probably do it there yeah. and see how it goes. Okay, cool. And uh, and do you do any acting as well or, or like other stuff in between? No, I don't. Do you do you act as well? Uh, I've been trying to get into it. Like this year, because there's no comedy, I was like, right, yeah. I'll go and try and do something else and see how far I can get, you know? And then, so I've kind of just signed up to all these, uh, you know, agency places and so see what I could get and like try and get a, a spotlight profile and stuff, you know? Yeah, and doing these uh, these short films and stuff and there was this woman who's on the course uh, oh, sorry woman who's on this woman who's on this uh short film with me and i was chatting to her it's like you know so okay yeah how'd you get into this yeah well i paid 10 grand for a accredited course so i could get a spotlight profile and i was like i'm doing the same thing you're doing <laughs> you know but it, i thought i didn't say this to her but i thought to myself yeah, right. I was, you know because i thought that'd be probably end of the conversation and so, yeah. I was, <laughs> so yeah totally it was like oh sorry you wasted like 10 grand on and you're doing the same short film that i'm doing so uh, like you know i was like why 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 pay 10 grand when you can just get the experience as you know as you go because you need four credits to get a spotlight profile so i'm just trying to do something else to it's, you know yourself johnny it's nothing like comedy comedy's myth and and acting for me is just it's just like it's not the same hit is it, are you a good actor if you're an, a good stand-up do you know what? Right, it it really has helped me. It really, it really had all those all those performer skills, with like you know, an acting out skills for a comedy are so transferable, man. They're like I was like, oh, this is this is fun. Auditioning used to terrify me, and then improv and stuff on the way kind of helped me get out of my shell, and start to kind of like go, oh no, I've done enough auditions now that it's not it doesn't worry me so much anymore. If you've done any acting before. I have, okay. but nothing that is on your level. Like well, mate, my level is up. probably the same as your level, mate. Don't worry, there's no step up here. It's just like, it's just like you know when you, they say, that's a good take, you know, and you kind of go, okay, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and like you, you're not, because for me, I was never sure. 
if that was a good take. They liked it. I wasn't sure. So I was like, okay, um, so now I know when it's a good take, if you know what I'm saying. It's, it's more or less the same. It's just only, the only thing is, where do you look? What do you do with your hands? <laughs> yeah, wow. You know, rather than have the claw. you got to just test your boundaries, isn't it? And see where else you can kind of land. Yeah, well, you get some material out of it. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, there's been this. There's, there's definitely been adding to the uh, the joke mine for sure. Are you gonna plan to come back to the UK anytime soon? You know, I think I was actually talking to a mate. I may go back, but it will be just straight to Edinburgh and just have a lot of fun with a show for a couple of weeks, yeah. and then maybe go down to london for a couple of shows and then have more fun than gigs and then leave i think yeah i think that's because i think it's i was there for so long and i enjoyed it but if i go back it'll be just straight to edinburgh i asked this question for to everyone to come on the show you know some people have a a model of kind of performer that they are uh like it could be like it could be a trade or you could be like a um you could be an animal of some kind, you know, like what you were talking before, you're saying that like, you know, it's that Id, the id, you know, the ego. Sean Mio describes himself as a a, tra- a gun for hire, you know, a, like a tra- traveling gun, like a, a bit like the uh, Kung Fu guy, if you like, you know, if you have one, it, it's a hard question, I know. But if you have one that you thought, you know, I'm a bit like this. I'm not sure, maybe a monkey sometimes. <laughs> Just a monkey, maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know. So Sean Mayo described himself as a gun for hire. Yeah, like a so like that's a yeah. How he sees himself. Gunslinger. How I feel is maybe when a genie comes out of a bottle, I feel like I'm allowed now to say these things that everyone in the crowd can only think of and not utter to other people. So I feel like a little bit like a genie, like I've got a little bit of power mm. over the crowd. I can say shit that they can't say, but they all think, yeah. whether they're too embarrassed or they haven't got the boundaries. You know, it's well within their boundaries to say something like that. Do you know what I mean? Oh, like a, uh, like a, a mage. Maybe, yeah. I, sometimes I feel like a boxer. Yeah. I feel like a boxer, especially when I go alone to a gig. It's very isolating, a boxer. You either do it or you don't. Um, you could get knocked out or you could kill. And then it's you alone on that stage. So, yeah, boxer. Yeah. I, I can I can sympathize. Sometimes I feel like a boxer, I would say. Yeah, because you've done all the training, haven't you? You've done all the training. There's just other things that get added on top of that that you haven't quite planned for but you've done everything you possibly can do yeah i think the more i think about it i would say a boxer cool ducking and weaving i'm either gonna get it done Mm. or i'm not i know even in a bad situation if i completely die that's a knockout and i have been knocked out and Mm. i know what that feels like it's horrific i've been booed off stage i've you know, just felt so fucking low and yeah, as low as a boxer lying on the canvas, just fucking destroyed. But then there's been other moments where I've knocked the crowd out and it was an amazing buzz and it's been the same material. So I had the same punches, I had the same combos, Mm. the same setups, the same structure of jokes but on one night it would work and the next night it just completely wouldn't so that's where as a boxer i had to go back and look at my style my delivery my technique Mm. and work out why was it working in this gig and why not that gig so yeah Yeah. boxer i think nice i'd luck in boxer magic 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 boxer yeah (laughs) that's cool so like can can you tell me about the okay let's go the worst gig then we'll wrap up with this one of the worst gigs ask me next month and it might be different i'm not sure it just <laughs> depends what my brain is allowing me to access sure. for, fear, for protecting itself fair play uh, one of the worst gigs i did was in south london i don't know where it was but it was definitely south london i lasted seven minutes they just did not like me i started getting booed started that made me incredibly nervous 
the booze got louder, it got to the point where I started losing cohesion. Mm. Setups were broken. Punchlines were out of place. Nothing made sense. I was talking and I could just understand. All I understood was that what was coming out of my mouth wasn't making sense. I was completely rattled and yeah. I just said oh, I should go and they went, yeah, fuck off and I walked out oh. and I lasted seven minutes and yeah, it was fucked. Yeah. I haven't felt that feeling in such a long time and that was like South London 2015 or 2014. Remember I drove around looking for Milo and I ate the whole fucking tin. I've only done that maybe twice in my life like a comfort thing oh man sat on the steps at a bus stop and just poured the whole tin of milo in my down my throat and just chewed it with a tiny smidge of milk here and there to keep it glugging like a paste <laughs> and that was i don't know i remember reading somewhere jerry seinfeld said if you have a horrific gig go do something fun that you relish that you know is bad for you so <laughs> I can't do heroin, so I did Milo. What's Milo? Milo is a chocolate cocoa powder, which is hard to find in London because it's an Australian thing. So that's why I had to drive around South right. London trying to find it. But eventually <laughs> I did in a huge fucking Tesco that accommodated for uh, import section. That's the word discombobulation is definitely apt for when that does happen, when you just go nothing is making any sense and the words are not in any correct order and <laughs> sentence form yeah and it, go, it goes back to that what, what you were talking about before like i'm just reminded of the boxer it's mm. just the boxer has just received such a huge punch to the head and yeah. he just can't orientate himself yeah he's gone north and south he's inverted he's just gone and that's how I felt on stage. I could just hear the booze and each boo was getting into my editing department in my brain, oh. shuffling the desk about. So I wasn't oh, able no. to feed myself any lines. I, no. was, I just broke down. Yeah. It was just an amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. and it's a, it is, in hindsight, uh, a wonderful feeling. Yeah. Because if you can learn to embrace it, yeah oh brutal. it's a, a beautiful car crash sometimes isn't it it's like anything that goes extreme to one way or the other is it's beautiful in its own way sometimes yeah absolutely man so johnny uh where can we find you uh facebook johnny cats j-o-h-n-n-y-k-a-t-s and uh i'm redoing my website so it's all down at the moment but it'll be back in four weeks so by february up and uh so yeah find me on facebook and then i'll have links to my website and my spotify and you on twitter as well and, and instagram uh i'm not on twitter and i'm not on instagram right. i just didn't get anything out of it are you on there i'm on both those places yeah yeah i, I deleted my twitter because i had loads of jokes on it just took all the jokes off and then restarted again and i i, I dip in and out of it it's not really um i'm not an addict on it or anything TikTok, it's, you know, it's people jumping on this thing now. Have you, are you using TikTok? No, I haven't. I've got, I have an account, but I don't really, I don't, I haven't put one video on yet. It's just, you know, it just seems like an extra thing to distract my attention from the things I should be doing. Yeah. You know, so, I, and I, I already have not Netflix already, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's just too much. I'm like, no, look, I, I know there's streaming, various other stream platforms, which I can't get other things on. But, you know, it's like, there's enough out there to distract me, you know, it's like, oh, the, and oh, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, it, it, some people are using it. I'm like, mm, yeah, we just go back to writing some, you know, really good show and, you know, that's what I'm going to do. So when is your next gig? My next, I, I've no idea. Wow. I've, I have literally no idea. It's, it's a bit kind of, yeah, That's Twilight Zone, that sentence, isn't it? Purgatory, mate. It's purgatory. Yeah. Just, I had that a few months ago. Yeah. Just keep meditating, man, because I suffered anxiety. It's, yeah. it's so strange, but and meditation helps, but it does affect you, especially if you're doing, you've been doing stand-up as long as me, pretty mm -hmm. much, so it will affect you. It's weird. It comes out in the strangest ways. Yeah, I've been, I, yeah. You're not getting up on stage. 
yeah, I've been having the like anxiety dreams and because there's no end to it, it feels. But yeah, apart from that, it's great. <laughs> but Johnny, I really w- I wish you the best with uh, Visceral. And if you're over coming over to the UK, let me know a couple of months in advance and I'd love to have you down for um, hopefully when things start thawing here because uh, I've run two nights. Um, hopefully I can get you on. And, That'd you know, be great. See I think some. If, if I do, it'll be 2022. Fine. Yeah. Do keep me in mind, man. This, this, by then it'll be, should be thawed and everything hopefully be running like normal. So Cool, man. Mate, and pleasure to talk to you, mate, and uh, to catch yeah. up. And uh, I will, um, uh, so I wish you all the best with the rest of your evening, man. Are you, um, are you gigging anywhere tonight or the next couple Not of days? Tonight. Then the rest of the week I am Tuesday right through to Sunday. Oh. Great. I know. Hold fast, man. You'll be right. All right, man. Well, I'll tell you, well, uh, good luck with the rest of the gigs, man. And uh, uh, yeah, hope thanks. to see this visceral pretty soon. Cheers, buddy. Thank Take you. Take care, man. Bye. You too. And that was episode 93 with Johnny Katz. I hope you enjoyed that one. Go and find him on Facebook. Johnny Katz. J-O-H-N-N-Y. K-A-T-S and you can link to his website from his Facebook account he's a brilliant comedian I hope Visceral went really well for him this year and uh, when he's over in this country I will advertise it on here and let you know when he's playing in the fisheries or in Abbots Langley so Johnny Katz for episode 93 hope you enjoyed that one guys and that's it for this episode and this year I hope you enjoy the rest of your Christmas break and as I say if you're working I hope you get that money in remember if you're off save some money for the end of January it's a long month The winter is still upon us. I'll speak to you guys again on the 26th of January with half of the Hate and Life crew, Darius Davis, for episode 94. Until then, Happy New Year. Take it easy. Don't work too hard. Enjoy the rest of this year. Hopefully next year will be much better.